thank you very much for the introduction. I'm going to give you a talk about uh, genetics today, about genetics of complex disorders, and it's going to be through uh, a very genetic uh, lens. So I've, I'm a visiting professor at King's College London. I spent about 21 years there researching into the genetics of complex diseases such as schizophrenia. And I have to say, for the first 15 years or so of those, we found very little uh, indeed. So what I want to tell you about is um, uh, a recent studies in genetics, a recent revolution in genetics, in which we think we can identify um, genetic risk factors for many of these disorders, and also what that means uh, and where we can take that. And uh, since 2012, I've been working for a pharmaceutical company called Eli Lilly, and there we hope to take some of this new scientific information and turn that into discoveries that lead to new treatments for these uh, disorders. So the first thing we know about many disorders is that they have a strong influence from our genes. They don't have an exclusive influence from our genes, as we've heard. Um, for example, monozygotic twins are often discordant for complex disorders, so they're multifactorial. But certainly, genes play a significant and strong role in these, especially in what we call neurodevelopmental disorders, such as schizophrenia, which is 60 to 80 percent heritable, autism, 70 to 90 percent heritable, uh, and even other disorders such as depression, perhaps 30 to 40 percent heritable. So these have uh, a genetic architecture, they have many genetic risk factors involved in them, and they also have uh, environmental factors and other factors as well, which is why we call them uh, complex genetic disorders. So this is the kind of headline from twin studies, but it doesn't tell you anything about the kind of genes and the kind of biological processes that might be involved in these disorders. So that's what we want to learn uh, from genetic studies. So finding genes for these disorders is a very difficult process. We have 3.6 billion base pairs of DNA. We have perhaps 20 or 30,000 genes. So we have to try and find a way uh, to look through these and try and identify uh, what biology might be going on. And this is what I spent my time at King's College doing, failing miserably for 15 years until we had new technology that came along that really gave us the tools to be able to do this. So 60 years ago, we had, this is Rosalind Franklin's famous photo 51, which led to the unravelling of the structure of DNA. So in just six decades since then, uh, we're now able to have this fantastic genetic technology. These are high-density gene chips or gene arrays. And with one of these arrays, we can look at millions of genetic polymorphisms in one individual uh, in a single experiment. And this gives us tremendous power to make discoveries in genetics. And this has really only been possible in uh, the last few years. And we could do something called genome-wide association study, GWAS. Um, we can take tens of thousands of individuals with a disease and tens of thousands of individuals without a disease, and we can compare them. We can compare them uh, in this kind of graph here, if I use the pointer. This is what we call a Manhattan plot, and it's called a Manhattan plot uh, because it's supposed to resemble uh, Manhattan. And it's a simple way of expressing genetic association in the genome. So genome-wide association is a very simple experiment. We take a single... Uh, genetic polymorphism, a single nucleotide polymorphism. This is represented by this dot here. And we compare the frequency of that between tens of thousands of people with a disease and tens of thousands of people without a disease. And we see a difference in frequency. And if we see an association with disease, if it's more common in the disease, we see these little peaks, these little skyscrapers here. So by doing these big experiments with millions of genetic polymorphisms in tens of thousands of people, we can really start to uncover the genetic architecture of diseases uh, such as schizophrenia. So this is an example of that. This is a disease I've been working on for over 20 years, schizophrenia. It's a severe psychiatric illness. About a third of sufferers have a lifelong course that doesn't respond to therapy, and treatments are very poor. So we really want to make an effort to try and understand the biology behind it. And this is a Manhattan plot for schizophrenia. This is from the Psychiatric Genetics Consortium, which is a group of almost all schizophrenia geneticists in the world who got together to do uh, a very big and very powerful uh, experiment. This has about 30,000 people with schizophrenia, volunteer patients, and about 30,000 controls as well. And you can see all these little skyscrapers here. These are genetic associations. These are genes that are increasing risk of schizophrenia. 
And what we found so far, that we can identify about 80 of these, and probably they are, there are hundreds of uh, genetic risk variants for this disorder. And they have two uh, interesting properties. One is that they increase your risk by a really tiny amount. Um, each one of these might increase, increase your risk of schizophrenia from 1% to, say, about 1.05%. That's a very small increase in risk. Uh, so you need hundreds of them uh, to make up the risk for disease. And also, we all have these genetic variants. We all possess genetic risk factors for schizophrenia, for diabetes, for all other complex disorders as well. So we call these thousands of variants the polygenic cloud. Uh, and this is what gives rise, at least in part, to susceptibility to many of these uh, diseases. And we can start to dissect this polygenic cloud and see if we can find clues about biology that we can use to develop new treatments for these uh, disorders. In the second part of the talk, I'm going to tell you about uh, a different type of genetic variant that predisposes to uh, diseases such as schizophrenia and autism. Uh, and it relates to something I have in common uh, with this men, and also an important study in the Icelandic population uh, of genetics. And this was published uh, in Nature in August last year. And it's talking about Genovo mutations and father's uh, age. So we have a little clue there as to what I might have uh, in common with those men. So what happens in human populations is that as we, uh, when we have children, uh, mutations occur during, uh, during uh, formation of eggs and sperm, and each of our offspring have about, on average, 60 new mutations in their genome. So those are mutations that uh, we don't have but have arisen uh, in our children. And what's interesting is that you get about uh, 50 of these from the father and 13 of those uh, from the mother. And the reason for this is that mutations are more likely to arise in sperm uh, than egg. And as fathers age, their sperm keep divide, dividing and they accumulate more uh, mutations. In fact, the rate, the number of mutations doubles about every 16 years with the age uh, of the father. So this is interesting. This is interesting um, in relation to father's age, uh, the effect of father's age on the risk of diseases uh, such as schizophrenia uh, and autism, but it's also part of our biology. So what I have in common with these men is that I'm an older father. Uh, I have uh, five children. Um, you'll also perhaps realise from this that soon I'm going to have uh, four teenage daughters to look after in just a few years' time, uh, which I'm in slight trepidation about. Um, so Alice, my oldest daughter, I'll have given her about perhaps 50 new mutations in her uh, genome as my legacy to her. Joe was born when I was uh, 49. I'll have given him around about 120 new mutations or so. So as I'm ageing, I'm passing on more and more mutations to my offspring. Um, this, uh, as you'll have guessed, these are all older fathers. Uh, they've all had children at a late, a late age, much later than me. Uh, 70 for Marlon Brando, 77 Charlie Chaplin, uh, 62 for Cary Grant. So they're all uh, older fathers. So de novo mutations are important also in psychiatric disorders. Probably about half the risk of diseases such as schizophrenia and autism may relate to uh, de novo mutations that fathers pass along to their children. Uh, so they're important causes, and we can start to use that to understand the biology uh, of this disorder. But it's not anything to be particularly worried about. Being an older father increases your risk of having a child with schizophrenia, but only by a really uh, tiny amount. But uh, what's interesting is that there are also positive benefits to mutations uh, occurring in our genome. Um, so this is a quote from uh, uh, a paraphrase from Steve Jones, the British geneticist. Um, where he laments the fact that uh, not enough older fathers are having uh, children now because in evolutionary terms, it's new mutations that drive human evolution and many of these are generated uh, by older men. So as part of evolution, mutations need to occur. Uh, some of those are <coughs> beneficial in the population. They're selected for uh, and they spread and this has a positive effect. And also there's evidence that uh, children with older fathers and grandfathers uh, live longer. So there is good news around mutations as well. Most mutations are neutral. Uh, some of them uh, will be under positive selection, do something good. Some of them will be under negative selection and do something bad. But we all carry 
uh, many, many uh, new mutations in our genome. Um, this is uh, a plot from the uh, UK census just showing the trend in age of fathers. So you may have uh, read about this in the press, the idea that um, the number of older fathers is increasing over time, and this might have something to do with disease. So you can see here from 1970, the average paternal age was about uh, 30. This has gone up now to about 33 in uh, 2010. So this looks like a convincing increase in paternal age. But if we look back in time, and this is to the uh, Icelandic population, which has very similar uh, information, their population records go back to about 1650. And in the past, paternal age has been, on average, around about 36, so a little bit older than it is now. So this hasn't changed much, in fact, uh, over time, apart from a dip uh, around about the 1970s. That might have uh, something more to do with the 1970s than with uh, human evolution. <laughs> so I'll just finish now. So um, what I, the message I hope to get across is that uh, complex diseases are caused by uh, genetic clouds, clouds of uh, hundreds or thousands of mutations. Uh, we all have uh, mutations and polymorphisms that carry disease. Uh, uh, they're, they're, um, they're present in all of us and they're common in the population. And we have a polygenic cloud. Uh, these are hundreds of common genetic variants. And we have a rare variant genetic cloud. These are um, tens of thousands, if not millions, of rare mutations in our population. Uh, these can do good things, uh, or these can uh, do bad things. Most of them are doing nothing at all. And we all pass on new mutations to our offspring, uh, especially older fathers. So this gives you uh, some idea of new discoveries in the genetics of human disease. And the next stage, really, is to go beyond these genes and try and understand the underlying biology and design new treatments that might be beneficial for uh, people with these illnesses. Thanks. Thanks.